arcades defined the gaming experience of the 80s and 90s. Before there were RPGs, adventures, and first-person shooters, arcade-style gaming dominated the hearts and minds of kids and adults alike. Games created for arcades were different. They weren't just about an exciting time for the players, but also profit for the arcade operator, eating quarters like no tomorrow and milking us of loose change for decades. Yes, arcade games were hard. You had to pay to play, and the worse you'd play, the more you'd pay. Part of what defined arcade gaming was expertise. Short, intense experiences that didn't last more than 30 minutes, but demanded perfection from the player. Either that or half a day's pay, shaking you down for your lack of skill. This is where one credit clears became a popular goal. Not simply to show off your skills, but to get as much game time and fun as possible for only a quarter. But whether you were a master or a scrub, you kept coming back for more, simply because there was nothing else like it at the time. And getting together with friends and sharing that experience, not online behind a screen, but shoulder to shoulder, our gaming moments we'll always remember. While the most popular, well-known games eventually made their way home to consoles and computers over the generations, cementing their place in gaming lore, some of the most amazing releases never did for a myriad of reasons. Whether licensing costs, difficulty to port, or limited release, games that would be considered must-play classics today were instead lost to time and obscurity games just as good as some of your all-time favorites that have never seen a home port to this day and still remain relatively unknown decades later. So in this video, we're going to highlight some of the absolute best that never made it, must play games that you've possibly never heard of or played along with popular games that are known by fans that have been begging for a port but for whatever reason has just never happened and also how you can actually play those games right now whether through emulation fpga or using a super gun like timmy here in the most arcade accurate way possible man you aren't kidding this game's kicking my ass that's because you're playing it sideways doofus you need to rotate the tv Oh, well that was dumb, even for me. Yes, the mind truly wobbles. Now, how did I do this? Oh yeah, so easy, even for me. And as part of this video, in honor of my channel, recently reaching 10,000 subs, wow, because you guys are just so awesome, we're going to give away a fully functional super gun. And that includes an actual arcade board that you can use to start playing. So later in the video, I'll show you how it works and how easy it all hooks up so you can start playing arcade boards at home. And this is all thanks to the incredible Mark Marta from my Discord, who most generously sent me both of these super guns so I could pay it forward and give one of them away to a lucky winner. And all you have to do is watch and enjoy the video. But while you're doing it, look for a very obvious secret code. Leave that in the comments, make sure you're subbed, and that's it. You're entered to win. And if you're already on my Patreon, you're automatically entered to win, along with a second entry as a thank you for the support. Are you done shilling your channel yet? Let's get on with it. All right, all right. In that case, let's start off with an arcade legend, Toa Plan. You ever wonder what it would be like to play Tatsujin? Only instead of a ship, you get to run around and kill everyone on foot. Well, wonder no more, because OutZone is possibly the baddest Toa Plan game you've never played. 
or possibly even heard of, developed by Tatsuya Uemura. It's a vertical run and gun that may as well be considered a shooter, minus the auto-scrolling screen. And it's as classic Toa Plan as it gets. If Tatsujin is my favorite Toa Plan game, Outzone is right there in my top three. It's that good. The pixel art has that beefy alien look. The bosses are big and creative. And the music is on fire. Composed by Uemura himself, it would easily fit into a Zero Wing sequel and makes the game a blast to run through. And blast is the right word, because this game is fast. Everything about the stage designs and enemies are designed to keep you moving, including many areas with constantly respawning enemies, so you can't just sit back and wait to cheese them. That includes an energy meter that's constantly ticking down, and once it runs out, you die. So you gotta keep moving, and that means properly routing the levels, just like you would in a shmup. The bullet patterns are very much Toa Plan too, often leading you and coming from all directions. Staying powered up in some areas is a requirement, and trying to recover from a death is often brutal. Dying means going back to a checkpoint. Yep, no respawns here. Outzone is like the most classic Toa Plan shooter in every way, down to the unforgiving arcade difficulty. There is an international version that makes the game easier and respawns you where you die, as well as doing that when playing it to players with a friend. But in return, it's missing some of the awesome weapons and other options which makes the game less interesting. From a flamethrower to a shield, an ultra-powerful spinning ship in a ball, and even occasionally giving you your own Tatsujin ship as an option. How cool is that? I'm always so bummed when it eventually gets shot down and disappears. You'll also get the occasional speed up, which is critical in dodging these blazing fast bullets. And most importantly, the E pickups that replenish your energy meter, essential for making it through the stage without running out of time. When you're almost out, you actually slow down to a crawl before you die, which is extra frustrating when you're so close to grabbing one just in time. Must have energy. Aw, oh, come on. And in the two-player mode, the game really comes into its own, with a lot of strategy covering each other while the other goes in for the kills, working as a team to get through some really hairy sections. It's one of the coolest classic co-op games that you can play, where you feel like you're working together versus just playing with someone by your side. I mean, there's not much to say at this point. You're seeing the footage. It's awesome. By now you're wondering, where has Outzone been all my life? And how am I going to play it as soon as this video is over? And you should. Of the original Strider Arcade? Okay, who doesn't? Yet very few have heard of Osman, aka Cannon Dancer. Surprising, considering how awesome it looks, not to mention how much like Strider it appears. You'd think it would have attracted tons of attention in arcades at the time, but it wasn't to be. Directed by the very same person, Koichi Yatsui, after leaving Capcom for another company, Mitchell Corp. The similarities are not a coincidence. It's about as wild, unusual, and creative, though also different in many ways once you really get into it. Your moveset is expanded with not only a jump and slide, but also being able to throw from a slide, as well as pile drive enemies from the air. 
you also get three special attacks that do massive damage, but need to be saved for the later bosses in the game, at least if you know what's good for you. And in general, you have much more control, being able to change directions in midair when you jump. But most important, and the key mechanic of the game, are your shadows, which are used much like in Ninja Gaiden 2 on NES, strategically positioning them for damage while you remain in safety. Unlike Hiryu, you don't have any weapons. You are the weapon, and using your shadows as an extension of yourself is how you kick some serious ass. While the game looks like a Twitch platformer at first glance, rewarding raw skill. The opposite is true. Osman will punish you for improvisation. The enemies come hard and fast, and unless you remember exactly what to do in each scenario, it'll hand you your ass. But the good news is, much like Strider, the levels are short and sweet. And once you learn them and the mechanics, the game becomes much easier. So once it's no longer making you look like a scrub, you can blast your way through it and enjoy the fast pacing and creative levels. Osman is a game that's as fun to watch as it is to play. The story is nonsensical and confusing, which fits the game just fine. But the main event here is definitely the visuals, stages, and insanely fast and fun gameplay. Unlike Strider, you respawn where you die, and if you simply credit feed your way through the game, it's about as fun as doing the same with a shmup, which is to say, not much. It'll just destroy you every step of the way while you try to button mash your way through it. And when you finally get to the very difficult final stage, and it suddenly forces you back to a checkpoint when you die, you'll be stuck. It's telling you to go back and get good. Have fun learning the game's mechanics before you come back, as once you do and memorize how to defeat this area as well, it'll also seem like a breeze. Every area has a trick, every segment a best route, and every mid-boss a cheese to kill them safely. If you're going for a 1cc, I hope you saved your bombs, because you're gonna need them. You'll have to fight three of the previous bosses all at the same time. And if there's a way to not have them tear you to shreds, aside from dropping a couple bombs to take them out quickly, I haven't found it. Osman isn't a perfect game. The music isn't very prominent, and it's extremely unforgiving of anything but mastery of its stages. It has a good bit of RNG, random ways it can upend your run that seem unfair, and credit feeding this one just makes it lacking. I didn't like it at first myself, but once I forced myself to go back and learn to complete each stage without death so I can blow through each level. I realized how much like Strider it is in that regard. It's just a harder game and requires an extra level of practice. And it's only at that point where it becomes really fun. Osman scratches that itch of mastery like some of the best. It's a quick pick up and play, a game you can finish in 20 minutes or less. And it'll absolutely wipe the floor with you until you figure it out. But once you do, Blowing through it without nearly a death is a damn good time, and a shame it never saw the light of day outside arcades. Highly recommended for fans of Strider and those looking for a challenging platformer to learn. Every review of Boogie Wings should start the same, letting you know up front that this game is 
batshit crazy. It throws everything. The fat lady, the blues brothers, the neighbor's dog, Santa Claus, and the kitchen sink at you, either to kill you or distract you while you're playing. If you can think of it and you didn't see it, it's probably dancing around in there somewhere, and you just haven't seen it yet. Boogie Wings is brimming with the tiniest details in every stage, to such a degree, it's hard to imagine how much time it all took. It's a game I had to show, as you have to see it to believe it. You start out with your biplane, which happens to have a hook, and this hook can grab nearly anything in the game. Sure, it's got a spiky bomb, which you can either swing around and bash things as you fly, or throw it for some big damage. But when your hook is free is when the fun begins, as you can grab nearly anything in the game with it, swing it around, and then throw it around at enemies. Every little soldier, random boxes and items, smaller vehicles, obstacles, yes, even the T-Rex head, and swing them around like a wrecking ball. But wait, there's more. Your biplane can only take two hits, and one of the gimmicks is once you explode, you jump out of the plane and start running around, run and gun style, like a crazed little lunatic. You're super fast, and you jump high, and you can bounce around on anything without getting hurt. And the best part is, you can now jump into a host of other vehicles sprinkled throughout the level, and ride them metal slug style. And I use the term vehicles loosely, as that also includes things like horses, elephants, and even a giraffe. If you can sit in it, or saddle it, you can ride it. You'll find yourself jumping from one to another constantly, wreaking as much havoc as you can before the next one pops up. You're really strong too, as you can lift all kinds of items and toss them around, Power Stone style. Boxes, chairs, furniture, or God knows what that they threw into that part of the level. And yes, it does good damage to enemies too. One of the coolest stages is the transporter, where you fight a giant zeppelin, moving from your plane to what looks like you're pedaling an Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, then later infiltrating on foot and working your way through the inside including a zero-gravity segment where you, the enemy, and all the containers bounce around the interior, eventually making your way to the rear of the Zeppelin before blowing it all to hell and escaping in another plane. There's also a Christmas stage, which is a total riot, with a remix of Joy to the World playing in the background, while shoppers go about their business as if all this carnage isn't happening around them. tiniest little details like you emerging into a stadium and the players looking at each other confused, not knowing what the hell's going on. The game just has an insane amount of things around you and you'll only get a glimpse of a small portion every time you play. There's just too much to see. The level of interactivity is unmatched. Everything happens to the backdrop of a World War I era, early 1900s motif, with not only the music, but fantastic sound effects that make the levels feel alive. It's not the tightest game in terms of control or gameplay, but for something like this, it doesn't have to be. Play it with a friend for the craziest time in a long time. It's wild, it's wacky, and it's a game that's hard to forget. Anyone ever says, hey, do you remember that game where you fight a Trojan horse while riding a giraffe? Now you'll know, that game is Boogie Wings.
ZZX was supposed to be the shooting magnum opus for early 90s Konami, hot on the heels and by the same team that developed the incredible Gradius II Gopher. Zezex is still one of the most visually creative shooters they've ever made. Unlike their more sober and serious other games, it goes all out in its art design, with some of the most bold graphics and effects in arcades of the time. So advanced in fact, that ports for the Super Famicom and PC Engine were scrapped, as they couldn't do the original justice. It still remains one of the most visually unique and striking games Konami's ever produced. From the opening stage with the scrolling green sky, to the beautiful pink backdrop and cascading waterfalls of Stage 3, it's like a mix of Salamander and the later Parodius games with its vibrant aesthetic. Every stage has its own unique look or cool effect it pulls off. Not only is the game so interesting visually, but the music is also classic Konami, with some of the best tunes they've made of that era, and fitting perfectly with the action. The only thing you can say is that the overall design lacks cohesion, where the stages are so creative and out there that each one feels completely original and different from the last. Like there isn't a common thread that ties them together, and it's more a collection of the most creative designs the team could come up with. But that's not a bad thing when it's this good. And I haven't even touched on the gameplay, which is a huge departure for Konami, and instead, their version of making an Irem game. And it's not even subtle. They literally rip off the force pod mechanic mixed with the tentacle from X Multiply. Both Irem classics. Your pod protects you from incoming shots and can be launched as a tentacle to either damage enemies or protect you from incoming fire, losing your charge shot while it's away. When attached, you have a powerful tentacle attack, and using that tentacle strategically and defensively is what you'll need to survive. There's also a ton of weapon variety throughout, with some standouts like the cool spiral beam or the shadow laser that follows you as you move up and down the screen. But don't let the initial impression of being an Irem clone fool you, as after the first stages, the gameplay speeds up quite a bit, with tons of bullets flying your direction. If anything, Zezix may look like Irem and have its mechanics, but it plays much like Gradius, only with the added mechanics of the Force Pod and Tentacle. It's an awesome mashup that works and makes the game incredibly fun. I could wax poetic about how amazing this game is for another half hour, but I wanted to mention the nerfed international release. Don't play that one and make sure it's the Japan original. To try and make the game even more difficult, it was ruined by the localization team in the process. It completely removes most of the cool weapon upgrades, leaving you with very basic power-ups only. Instead of a checkpoint system, it gives you respawns, and instead of lives, you get an energy bar. But to compensate, they increase the number and speed of the bullets even more to some ridiculous levels. They also took away your auto-fire. Joy! And finally, on top of that, the tentacle doesn't quite work the same and can only be launched instead of just detached. Completely borking a lot of the strategic sections will you need it to do that to properly survive. It's just not thought through, except for making more money for the arcade operators. And I highly recommend sticking with the original. So what else can I say that isn't already up on screen here? Zezex is a masterpiece. Why wasn't it a hit if it was so good? Well, it may have come out around the same time as a little game called Street Fighter 2, which literally took everyone's attention. So it didn't do nearly as well as expected and was criminally overlooked. Oh, and unlike the other games in this video, it did get one, 
just one, Obscure Homeport by Konami as part of the Salamander Collection on the PSP. And it's worth getting just to play this game, trust me. But if it's on PSP, why is it on this list then? Because it's that good. And it's my video, and more people need to know about it. So bite me. Or just play Zezex. If you love Konami shooters, it's a straight up requirement. coolest thing about Cyber, as in cybernetic wyvern, is that it's a smorgasbord of bullets and patterns. In fact, I haven't seen many, or any games, that throw so many different types at you at the same time. There's aimed bullets, static patterns, bullets that lead you, small, destructible bullets and missiles, heat-seeking missiles and lasers, like in the Rayforce games, dense bullet hell patterns, and super fast psycho style loads, very large, round, cave like bullets, and tiny, battle garega style long bullets, and everything in between. Patterns up the wazoo. You name it, this game's got it. Cyvern also has an interesting banish attack, which is simply a press and hold of your main shot. You select from three different wyverns, and each has their own shot style and special attack. The red wyvern uses a short-range flamethrower, while the blue has a wide shot and heat-seeking lightning, clearly an homage to Tatsujin. And the green has a focused shot, along with a badass damaging laser. I personally prefer either the blue or the green, depending on the stage, which you get to select anew if you run out of your credit. And you won't be grabbing a 1cc of this one very easily, as it's as brutal as you'd expect it to be for a game that combines the speed of Psycho's bullets with some occasionally dense bullet hell patterns. It's always varied and never outstays its welcome. The bosses of the game are a total highlight and demonstrate most of all what makes it so fun. Not only do they have many forms, but they're always rotating their methods of attack. And the farther you get, the more these are combined together into some really devious volleys that'll absolutely murder you until you figure out each and every one. Cyvern is short at only five stages. Pretty typical arcade rock, but it's action-packed from start to finish with dense levels and long extended bosses with a seemingly endless set of phases. So as cool as the mechanized dragons are, the well-composed music and great boss designs, the star of the show for me is the melding of so many attack patterns into a single game. I'm told that it feels a lot like Raiden Fighters, which is a game I've not yet played. And if it's anywhere as cool and unique as Cyvern, I'll have to rectify that. And if you haven't played Cyvern, I do recommend you rectify that, post haste. Yet another arcade exclusive that never saw a port and desperately deserves one. Three, two, one, let's go. R-Type Leo may have been obscure in its release, being the very last R-Type ever to see arcades, but it's certainly not obscure any longer, being the arcade R-Type that every fan wants to see get a home port. The closest we've ever come is a single homage stage in the most recent R-Type Final 2. And while Leo was never originally meant to be an R-Type game, not having the same mechanics as the classics, it slowly earned its way into the hearts and minds of fans. Why does everyone want it so much? Well, look at it. The game is absolutely gorgeous. It's a sight to behold and arguably the most graphically impressive of the series. Since Leo was originally created as its own unique game, not meant to be R-Type, 
there's no force pod to be found, and the gameplay trends more toward the traditional horizontal shooter, with less puzzle elements than the series is known for. Your satellites now fire either forward or backward, depending on the direction you're moving, and the charge shot launches them out for a powerful attack before they quickly return to you. Despite not being a true R-Type, Leo is still a very cool and competent game, and while there's no Bido Empire to be found, many of the stages still feature a lot of organic alien forms, so it still has a similar vibe to the R-Type series. I actually already covered Leo in my now infamous History of R-Type video, along with just about every other game in the series including another arcade-only game, Armed Police Unit Gallop. Also a very cool and criminally overlooked game. So if you love R-Type and haven't seen it yet, check out that history video after this one and get your fill of Bido. But back to Leo, it's recommended simply for the sights and sounds alone, in addition to the faster paced and fun gameplay. As the most in-demand game of possibly the most well-known shooter series of all time, and it certainly deserves it. Up until now, I've been mainly focusing on the rare gems, amazing games that not only never saw a home port, but were virtually unknown outside of enthusiast circles. But what about the big games, the ones that everyone knew and loved, and are still crying about trying to get a home port to this day, and can still only be played on something like MAME. Oftentimes, it's due to licensing issues, a prime example being one of the most sought after arcade beat-em-ups, Aliens vs Predator. I recently did a full video review of the Capcom Arcade Stadium, over an hour, combing through and testing some of the best games, and I can't tell you how many comments I got saying they want Aliens vs Predator. Yes, yes, we all do. And it's probably not gonna happen because of licensing. But did you know that's not the only cool Aliens game that never made it out of arcades? Four years prior, in 1990, before Capcom used the license, it was Konami that released a rad Aliens game that I used to play all the time, back when I was 12 years old. Instead of a beat-em-up, it was more of a horizontal run-and-gun, with some hybrid elements thrown in. And I can tell you, as a group of kids that couldn't get into the theater to watch Aliens, rated R, the game was the best way for us to experience it. And Konami did right by the license, especially in terms of atmosphere. As unlike the beat-em-up, this one had the creepy vibe of the film, and it made us all want to see it even more, and seek it out on VHS to watch when the parents were away, which probably wasn't a good idea, as I remember that flick scaring the shit out of me as a kid. Though I love it now, Aliens has a lot of nostalgic value for me, and along with Aliens vs Predator that we wish would show up to play at home. Well guess what? I've got some good news, as if you're an owner of the Mr. an awesome FPGA device that's taken the gaming community by storm, you're about to get your wish. The Capcom CPS2 core is now complete, which is the board AVP was based on. So we'll be playing it shortly in arcade perfect form, whether on a CRT through its analog output, or on a modern TV via HDMI. This is actual footage from the beta core of the game running on Mr. So look forward to playing this bad boy soon. If you're not familiar, the Mr. is an FPGA device that's open source, meaning the entire gaming community as a whole is developing cores for it, both arcade and home console. Think of it like one of the analog systems, like this Mega SG, only it has both analog and HDMI outputs on it and is universal, and it can reproduce any of the games near flawlessly and without added delay. Look for an upcoming video from me soon on this exciting hardware, focusing on awesome games that it supports, including some of the best shmups you've never played, that you can play right now using this bad boy. 
And speaking of awesome Capcom games that we can't wait to play on the Mister, another CPS2 gem is the sequel to one of my favorite Rising games. Called Dimahu in the West, it was developed for Capcom by the Rising staff and is just as cool as the original. While the original Sorcerer Striker did finally get a rare PS4 release by M2 on the Japan eShop, the sequel Dimahu is still waiting in the wings. Along with Kingdom Grand Prix, which was released on the Sega Saturn, it completes the trifecta of fantasy-oriented shooters Rising developed, and you can play it on the Mister right now. Another core currently in development for the Mister are for various toy plan games, which is really exciting, not only for rare games like OutZone that I showed at the beginning of the video, but for other never ported games that we all can't wait for, like Dogyun and Tatsujin-O. Though the latter did get a single FM Towns port long ago, both have been as obscure as they come and in high demand by enthusiasts. So a Mr. Core would be more than welcome, and I would gladly hype and test it as it gets closer. Welcome to Violin City. Speaking of Toa Plan cores, it was Toa Plan who provided Rising with the initial hardware and components to make their games, including a game that's probably the most requested to never see a home release, Armed Police Batrider. Programmed by the legendary Shinobu Yagawa of Battle Garega fame, it was called the King of Fighters of Shmups by Hardcore 101. And they're not wrong. In addition to being a fantastic game, it's like the greatest hits of rising history. With well over a dozen characters to choose from, it feels like you're about to jump into a fighting game. Only once you do, you'll realize you're actually fighting for your life. In addition to its own lineup of characters, it's a mashup of favorites from the Maho Daisakusen games and Battle Garega. But it's not just limited to the characters, with even the boss battles featuring old favorites reimagined from the various games into one action-packed battle royale. Batrider is so deep and packed with nuance that I couldn't possibly cover it all in a short segment. So if this looks awesome to you, check out the full review by my friend Mark MSX from The Electric Underground. I've included a link in my description for anyone that does. Shooters, shoot 'em ups are one of the original forms of arcade games and used to be incredibly popular. So popular that they made a ton of them and so many of those great games were never ported. I still had a list of over a dozen of them that I really wanted to show, but there's just no way I'm going to be able to squeeze them all in. Oh, in any game, if you want to go from just a beginner to a pro, you need... A montage! Great idea! Uh, no. What's a montage? I was just gonna say, show it all really fast to some music. I, 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 I don't know what, I, I, I don't get, I, I.
there are so many arcade exclusives that I'd love to cover, but it's just impossible. So instead, let me show you one more way that you can play them at home. Built into this giant set of arcade sticks is a way to connect PCBs. It's a flexible and convenient way to connect them via the side JAMA interface. And it provides video and audio outputs to connect to either a cabinet or just a TV setup at home, like I have here. If you're using a modern flat screen, you can use something like a RetroTINK, OSSC, FrameMeister, or other RGB to HDMI converters to do it. And if you're using an old CRT, all you need is the right cable for your display. And this is what we're giving away. A rare, custom-built in Japan, no longer in production, Sigma Supergun. Again, courtesy of the incredibly generous Mark Marta from my Discord, who not only gifted us this super gun to give away, but also sent one to me so I can work on this video for everyone and keep it for myself to enjoy. Wow. So if you happen to be interested into getting into real arcade hardware with PCBs and multi kits, all you have to do is leave a comment, make sure you're subbed so I can keep track, and you're entered to win one of these super gun. And it will come with one board already. Heated Barrel, the game that you see behind me right now. And remember, regardless of how you choose to play the games or what you can afford, whether it's real hardware or FPGA or emulation, the important part is that you play and enjoy the games. Don't ever let the method of play stop you from the reason to play. Because no matter what you're playing on, it's not going to make you get good until you get good. So smoke them if you got them. Even if that means you're just getting smoked. Speaking of which, you're up, Timmy. All right, let's do this. Ah! <laughs> Shut up. 